Dr. Cuddy, are you there? Yes, sir. Well, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, we'll uh, <clears throat> pick up with my uh, book that's offered by Radio Liberty, The uh, Power Elite, Their History and uh, Future. Uh, but as usual, I try to give uh, a comment on something of contemporary interest, although I do try to relate uh, what's going on with uh, with that. And uh, what happens is, uh, for example, in Obamacare, I remember you had a, a good program on a couple of months ago with Dr. Russell Playlock, where he was talking about it was designed to fail. And uh, that's, that's very true. And what, what they do is it's very much like NAFTA, where NAFTA was rejected by and, and get uh, by about uh, two, no, three-fourths of the American people, but they rammed it through anyway by uh, peeling off enough votes uh, in the uh, Senate, uh, giving subsidies to or exemptions to tomato growers in Florida or whatever it is, to get the 51 votes they need to pass the thing. So in this case, uh, Obamacare, which is technically, I guess, called the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, uh, it's been signed almost uh, four years uh, ago now. Uh, and you, you wonder, you know, how, how could this be? How could they have uh, have gotten this? Well, the, the ultimate strategy, of course, is a single-payer system. So if you're going to have a single-payer system, this system has to fail. Uh, and so that's why, uh, like Dr. Blaylock said, there are so many mistakes. And you would say, well, gee, doesn't this really hurt the uh, the insurance companies? Well, they tend to only look at the, the immediate situation and immediate profits. So uh, what you would do is get the, the largest ones, like United Healthcare or MetLife or Travelers, Cigna or, or Prudential, to, to sign on is uh, you tell them that uh, uh, the federal government will guarantee any uh, funds that they uh, that they lose under Obamacare, so subsidized, and then you can subsidize individuals and so on. And as I've said several times in the past, whatever the federal government subsidizes, it basically calls the tune on it, and so it'll basically run it, and there you have uh, socialized medicine. And they were joined, of course, by the uh, uh, the uh, drug lobby that's called the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers is the, the actual name of the outfit, and... Uh, they uh, they always say they're they're doing it in, in to uh, to get a reform healthcare reform, and uh, William Borst has done a good uh, summary of this in something called the uh, Mincenti Report, and uh, there also you have to get support from major uh, companies uh, otherwise like uh, General Electric they they would be brought on board AARP of course is there the, the American Medical Association and uh, American Hospital Association. And so what they want to do is, when the government, federal government says, well, we'll pick up any losses, well, hey, you know, that's, that's great as far as they're concerned because that uh, shifts all the health care costs to the federal government, so they don't really have to, to worry about it. And then you get your usual leftist group suspects like uh, ACORN and, and the uh, Service Employees International Union uh, joining the effort. And, and once you get enough of those, uh, you can get the thing through. And it's just, like I said, just like NAFTA, they, they play this game where they'll either give certain groups exemptions or give other groups subsidies just to get enough support to get it passed. And that's all they wanted because then once it's passed and becomes a debacle, they say, well, you know, we tried, we tried, I guess we'll just have to go to a single-payer system. Hold that thought, or we'll be back in a moment. Well, this is Dr. Stan here at Radio Liberty. I guess this afternoon is Dr. Dennis Cuddy, who is talking about Obamacare. And he's simply pointing out that Obamacare is specifically designed to fail. And because then when it fails, they're going to say, oh, well, my goodness, we've got to have medical, medical care for the people. We're just going to have to have a single-payer system. And suddenly what you're seeing is Obamacare was intentionally designed to fail because they want a single-payer system so they can kill off a single significant part of our population, and you say, who in their right mind would want to do that? 
Well, we're not dealing with people with a right mind, ladies and gentlemen. We're dealing with people who create wars and revolutions. And you go into World War II, we financed certainly the Nazis, both before, during, and after the war. We helped Adolf Hitler and the Nazis to escape to South America. And basically, but of course, we can't let the American people understand that uh, the 60 million people died in a war where we were financing the enemy, just like we're financing the terrorists over there in Syria and throughout the Muslim world today. And as they've set up a health care system designed to fail. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Well, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, basically it. Uh, they, it. It all flows, as I've said, from the secret Nazi plan, which is under the uh, power elite. And they, their ultimate plan is part of it. Uh, <clears throat> just a brief recap, uh, when uh, the powers that be... Uh, could not control this young upstart American Republic, and they wanted to get them in debt, and Andrew Jackson wouldn't renew the charter of the Second Bank of the U.S. They uh, basically hatched uh, a plan, and uh, they would use a dialectical process. They created Karl Marx as the antithesis to free enterprise capitalism, and then the, the uh, ultimate goal is the world socialist government as the synthesis of Eastern communism, Western capitalism. Uh, and uh, before each, uh, you can have your world socialist government, each nation has to become socialist first, and that's what the word Nazi means, national socialism. And that's why President Obama was very important uh, to get elected and re-elected, uh, because he's leading us in that direction, the direction of socialism. Plus, uh, they want to have, uh, as Big Nev Brzezinski said at the first day of the World Forum, uh, under Mikhail Gorbachev at the Presidio in San Francisco in 1995, they're not going to get to world government through one quick leap, but through these region, process of regionalization. And so they have to also get a, a economic carrot uh, dangling in front of the people in the Middle East. And so they already have the EU and NAFTA and ASEAN and the African Union, so they want to get the, uh, the Middle East next and, uh, to link up with the Mediterranean Union. Uh, they want the, the broader structure and, and hold that thought. Hold that thought. Well, this is Dr. Stan. Our guest is Dr. Cuddy, and he's simply talking about how everything that's going on today is certainly laid out. He describes a lot of this in his book, The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan. The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan in the subsequent book. The Power Elite and their history and their future. The Power Elite, the history and their future. There is a Power Elite. Controls both political parties, stages elections every four years. And we can vote for the candidate of their choice. Go back and look at 2008. Who were the two candidates for president? One was the most liberal uh, Sydney senator in the United States, a Democrat in the United States Senate, Obama. The other was the most liberal Republican, John McClain, who ought to be a Democrat. And you had your choice. Do you want Socialist A or Socialist B? And the American people really had no chance or choice, but they really thought they did. They went to the polls, they cast their other vote for the candidates who'd been Pick for them by the power elite. But go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. You were talking certainly about how this whole thing is staged and manipulated to give the impression, of course, that we are electing our representatives. And basically, of course, that Obamacare is simply part and parcel of this to give us the idea that, oh, my goodness, that we just need to try to help the people because people need health care. Without pointing out, nobody went without health care, Sydney. Uh, Sydney, when I went to medicine uh, 60 years ago, why suddenly every county in this country had a county hospital? And if you couldn't afford to pay for medical care, you got it anyway. Oh, but of course, today, why well, there are an awful lot of people going without medical care, thanks to government interference. But go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, and <clears throat> I mean, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's a, a matter of if, uh, for example, there's, uh, I forget the particular phrase, but it's the, the regulations that hospitals must use uh, from the federal government. And if you're a person, a single person in a home, I'm trying to remember this off the top of my head, and you get $28,000 or less a year, you have that in your assets, you know, like your income and whatever else you have going for you. Uh, then the hospital will give you 100% write-off if, if you go to the hospital. And if it's two people, I think it's 38000 If there's two people in a dwelling 
and they would get, uh, if you have under $38,000 income and you're, you're poor, let's say, and you go to the hospital, they will give you 100% write-off. I was just talking to a hospital the other day about this. and They said, yeah, we follow the federal guidelines, 28000 for a person, single person dwelling, uh, two person, and 38000 and so forth. So, uh, yeah, the, it's actually required, uh, I believe, by, uh, by federal law that uh, you get the medical care, medical care that you need if you go to the hospital, if you know you, you need something, and uh, it's uh, it's not like if you made five thousand dollars, you got to pay it all to the hospital. No, you 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 get they just write it off. They just write it off. Okay. Uh, so what I was saying about under the secret Nazi plan is uh, the Middle East. Of course, Obama was very very important to that because of his uh, his Islamic background and his uh, favorable attitude toward the Muslim Brotherhood. And so those two things were very, very important in getting him in the office in the first place, the presidency, and then getting him reelected. But in terms of the uh, the Nazis and the secret Nazi plan, of course, all of this fits. Uh, and I mentioned this last week, so I won't belabor it. But the Nazis uh, actually were not the ones to develop this attitude, uh, Liebenstrom, via Liebenstrom. Uh, I forget the exact pronunciation, but it's uh, living, not worth the living, in terms of their eugenics uh uh, that they, they instituted. And they were just picking up on what Margaret Sanger and others in the international eugenics uh, movement had said, people, a lot of them from the United States. And uh, Ernst Rudin had a uh, publication uh, about why we need eugenics in uh, Margaret Sanger's birth control review, I think it was 1933 or 34. And so it's all, all part of this uh, this major plan of population control, uh, basically. There's, there's all types of population control. There's forced sterilization. Uh, there's abortions. Uh, there's an emphasis on homosexuality, because if you emphasize homosexuality, then they're not going to have any children, right? So you control the population there. And, uh, Dennis, I would simply point out, it's so difficult for the average logical human being to understand that if you read the publications put out by those advocating population control, they will op- openly talk about how we want to encourage homosexuality yep. because they don't reproduce. They know exactly what they're doing. I said, the major force behind this whole homosexual agenda is not the homosexuals. It is the power elite who are dedicated to population control, and they push homosexuality to limit the population, and the average individual says, why that couldn't be true, and that's because they never read the publications are put out by the people who are advocating and planning and plotting and conspiring to bring about population control, and they've already killed or prevented the birth of several billion people, 400 million abortions in communist China, funded by International Planned Parenthood in large part, which we fund, and 400 million abortions in India, funded at least in part by International Planned Parenthood, which we fund, and 400 million abortions in Russia, are funded at least in part by International Planned Parenthood, and on on and on and on, and nobody ever tells the American people. Go right ahead. Uh yeah, and uh, picking up on what I said about the Nazis uh, learning from Margaret Sanger and her, uh, uh, her uh, it's called the Birth Control League at first, then Planned Parenthood, uh, she had some books, several books, one's The Race of Thoroughbreds, and uh, she said we and there are certain dysgenic stocks, inferior stocks, uh, like blacks and gypsies and Jews and uh, Catholics and so on, and she meant Southern European Catholics, I think. But anyway, these are inferior stocks, and we need less of them and more of uh, the Anglo-Saxon uh, types that uh, she envisaged as uh, ruling uh, the world. And in fact, they were the people who funded her. Uh, David Rockefeller, I mean, uh, John D. Rockefeller, I think the second, is the one who introduced her to a lot of the, the big money people to get her uh, off the ground with her effort. And, yeah, in terms of abortion, I think uh, last year, I think the figure was there was something like 54,000 uh, pregnancies in uh, New York, uh, and I believe 34,000 of them ended with abortion. So it was only like, uh, I mean, and that was in the minority population, the black population. There were 34, uh, roughly 54,000 pregnancies 
and 34,000 of those ended in abortion. So in other words, they're killing more blacks than right. actually being born. This is a, a statistic. You can check it out on the Internet. Uh, they said they are aborting more black pregnancies than blacks are being born. They know exactly what they're doing. They're doing everything they can to suppress the black population. But that's a different subject, no question at all. They want to, be, uh, to do away with what they consider are inferior races. Go right ahead. Uh, yeah, and uh, also, it's a, it's a really comprehensive program, too. They, uh, they, uh, one of my articles, if you look at, uh, if you look at my articles on News with Views, uh, back some years ago, I think it was around 2006, about seven, eight years ago, I put one called the Aletheia Report, A-L-E-A-T-H-A, the Aletheia uh, Report, uh, which was a plan. I mean, step by step, you know, 1979, we'll have this particular media program, and 1980, we'll have this, you know, advertisements of major newspapers to uh, to uh, fulfill the uh, eugenic uh, process for euthanasia. See, there, there are several phases to it. There's euthanasia, there's abortion, there's homosexuality. All of these are wars. They love to have wars because that, you know, cuts down the population, especially the young patriotic types of whatever country, you know, male or female, the young patriotic types of whatever country, they go to war, they get killed, so you, so you kill them off. Uh, and uh, then <laughs> it's just supposedly left with themselves, the philosopher kings, like in the French Revolution or in uh, Plato's uh, Republic. But it's not just enough to kill them, kill them off. The, of course, some are going to be born, so how do you control them? Well, uh, the, the public has been uh, manipulated and conditioned to just have fun or to seek fun all the time. And that's what I was mentioning uh, several times in the past about Nero building the uh, Colosseum in Rome. He said, give them circuses. you got to keep the masses entertained. So like Orwell said, you speed up or quicken the tempo of human life. And secondly, you add to that uh, a, a lot of entertainment, you know, get them a lot of stupid soap operas and sitcoms on TV. And so they spend all their time doing that. And, of course, if you spend all your time doing that, you're spending your time Primarily not thinking. See, that's, that's the key. They don't want you to think. Uh, if, if you're reading a book or, you know, analyzing something or considering uh, a game that you're playing, like chess or checkers or whatever it is, you're, you're actually having to think. But if you look at the TV, I'm not saying you don't think, but there's far less thinking when you just look at a TV show or because you're absorbing stuff. You're, you're being entertained. The other people are doing the acting, and you're just like, you know, laughing or crying or yelling or screaming or having some sort of emotional response, which is what they want. They wanted to shift from the uh, cognitive, the thinking domain, the logical domain, over to emotion, the uh, feeling, the affective uh, domain, as they call it. Uh, because they can be more easily uh, conditioned and manipulated, uh, which is, of course, what they want to do with the population. And so uh, they also educationally want to, to have this impacted as early as possible. So you had back 20 or so years ago this fellow named Mark Tucker had joined up with the National Center on Education and Economy, and Hillary Clinton was on the board, and Mario Cuomo and David Rockefeller Jr. and so forth. And uh, they wanted this program uh, introduced cradle to grave. They would say that cradle to grave. And it's particularly the, the values that you have. And so how, how would you get the values of little children away from mommy and daddy teaching them biblical lessons, let's say? Well, you get them uh, fascinated with little uh, touchscreen sort of uh, pre, pre-computer games. And they did a survey last year, last year, and some, you know, before five years old, I think it was like 34% of youngsters at that particularly young age were using little touch screens, you know, elementary type little computer games. And uh, this the next year, I mean, the, the year after that, the most recent year, it went up to 41%. So little teeny kids are being programmed to, to be fascinated with this, with a computer and little games on their computers. And that's why they took God and prayer and the Ten Commandments out of our schools, so the schools, public schools, could be used to destroy the faith of the American people. And that's exactly what they've done, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are no longer a Christian nation, not by accident, but by intent. Dr. Cuddy, you go right ahead. Yeah, when when I was uh, a youngster uh, some decades ago, uh, we used to like to, to get outdoors. You know, we'd play baseball or if it's, you know, sort of fall or early spring basketball or you know, football in the fall or 
if it was rainy or something, we might play some cards, you know, canasta or rummy or something like that, or play games like Monopoly or chess or, or whatever. Uh, but uh, that's uh, that's not the case today. Uh, the, the, the poll I, that I just mentioned before the break shows that uh, these youngsters have become obsessed with just this, the, you know, the, the, in fact, you can see them. There was a, a woman visiting, helping my mother, and she brought her little two daughters. As soon as they hit the, the door, as soon as they hit the door, they came in, they sat on the steps, both of them whipped out their little Game Boy or whatever the thing is on the computer and started playing these games on the computer. They're, they're like, <laughs> it's like automatic. And so instead of running around getting fresh air or, you know, playing chess or something, no, no, they play these little computer games. And, uh, of course, uh, that you know, there's all kinds of games. Plus, it's very, very difficult for parents to supervise that because, you know, what, what's, the, what's the child doing? You know, is, he, is this a – is he going to slip into uh, some sort of violent uh, game that's, you know, blood and guts and all that on the, on the computer at, at an early age? Or is he going to slip into uh, uh, the, uh, the various occultic things which are, which are presented there, you know, Harry Potter types? And so on. So uh, this this is all very very carefully uh, mapped out. Very carefully mapped out. It's, it's not by accident, and it falls under the the, the Nazis uh, had this particular attitude. Their their plan. Of course, they're a sub part of the uh, the power elite's plan. And so uh, last week uh, we had gotten into the chapter called uh, the power elite and its uh, use of uh, misdirection. We had previously uh, looked at the psychological conditioning. Then the next chapter of the book is about misdirection, how things look one way or you try and present it one way and you really you have the opposite intent or uh, the opposite desired effect. And I, uh, I talked about the various, uh, various things, uh, like uh, the quote by Gamal Abdel Nasser talking about Americans don't make simple stupid moves, we make uh, complicated stupid moves, and that leads him to think we really have something else in mind, and uh, we usually do. And then we had uh, we had gotten on down to Bill Clinton's advisors, and, and then uh, President Obama's advisors, and uh, Valerie Jarrett, and, and then I had mentioned already uh, Brzezinski, he was a, speaking of Brzezinski, was an advisor to President Jimmy Carter, and then to some extent also uh, now President uh, Obama. And uh, for example, uh, you have a, a situation in which uh, you would think uh, a conflict is coming, you know, a major conflict. And what happens is, though, uh, you have Brzezinski, for example, uh, telling uh, certain individuals and stimulating certain conflicts like he lured the Soviets into Afghanistan. He denied it for a long time, but then he says, oh, yes, I really did admit it, uh, having something to do with that. And then uh, recently, more recently, anyway, he strongly advised President Obama not to take military action against Iran uh, to prevent it from developing a nuclear weapon, even though uh, Israel has informed that they believe uh, their very existence may depend on uh, taking uh, some sort of action like that. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. We'll be back here in just a moment. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and Dr. Cuddy is simply talking about what goes on really behind the scenes, the things that you'll you'll never really get through regular channels. And certainly, uh, certainly uh, he was just commenting how uh, Brzezinski, Zygmunt Brzezinski, was an advisor to President Carter. Certainly, Zygmunt Brzezinski now, uh, 30 years later, is uh, certainly an advisor uh, to uh, Obama, and he had recently advised Obama not to take action against Iran to keep them from getting a nuclear weapon, despite the fact that Israel has said that, that they think that they're going to have to do something with Iran because they're fearful that they will, Iran will come down with a nuclear weapon, and this will certainly be a threat to Israel. So go ahead, pick up the story there, Dennis. It, yeah, and, and you, you have to, like, I understand, like I've said many times, when you look at something and it doesn't seem to make sense, uh, ask yourself, well, how does it fit to the power elite's plan? So <clears throat> if you're saying, if you're wondering, Golly, you know, how come Brzezinski doesn't uh, take the same position that Israel does, that Iran's a threat if they get a nuclear weapon, it's you know, going to destabilize the whole region and so forth and so on? Well, you have to remember that Iran was very, very important in, in, uh, to the Nazis and part of the, the secret Nazi plan. 
uh, in the 1930s, for example, the Shah of Iran at that time admired uh, Hitler uh, so much that he changed his country's name in 1935 from Persia to Iran, uh, which in uh, Farsi, in the Farsi language, means Aryan, you know, like the Aryan race, like Hitler used. And uh, another example of uh, misdirection uh, regarding who is uh, to blame, let's say, uh, for the death of U.S. Ambassador Chris uh, Stevens and others in Benghazi, uh, there was a couple of years ago, about a year and a half ago, on CBS Evening News, uh, it was actually September 20th of 2012, uh, their reporter, and you've seen her, she shows up over there in the Middle East often, Elizabeth Palmer, uh, she indicated that the head of the Libyan government uh, says that Ansar al-Sharia was responsible, and that's the group that was responsible for killing Ambassador Stevens. However, in Time magazine, September 24th, just four days later, they said an Al Qaeda group called the Impri- called, this is a strange thing, imprisoned Omar Abdul Rahman Brigade is responsible. Now, uh, Omar Abdul Rahman, uh, he's, uh, uh, I think he's right up the street for me here. They, there's a federal prison about 30 miles away, and they put all of these, uh, all of these, you know, the blind shake uh, there and. Uh, and uh, what's his name? The, the guy who ripped off everybody in, in New York City of their their funds. So, yeah, all of these dangerous types they put right down the road for me for for some reason here. So anyway, uh, you had two different versions of who was responsible for that. Well, uh, the misdirection could be that if the former is uh, is responsible, you know, Ansar al Sharia, then the power elite to wants the latter one, Ansar. Uh, uh, Al I mean the the latter one, the uh, Abdul Rahman uh, brigade. Then what would happen is apparently would want the latter group blamed to distract from the former group's desire to uh, implement Sharia law far far and wide. So that could be one use of misdirection. Well, I now, think I think it's vitally important people understand that if we were installing Sharia law all yeah. over the Muslim world. The Muslims don't want it. The average Muslim, I said, they may be a Muslim, but he doesn't want to live under Sharia law. But we want to impose it on them. Why? Because we want this radical form of Islam, so we'll have an enemy to fight. I mean, after all, if you don't have an enemy, how can you have a war? That's why we, of course, created the Nazi movement. That's why we financed the Nazi movement, why we armed the Nazi movement, oh, both before and during the war, and then we helped all the Nazis escape to South America, or brought them here and helped Hitler. And why? Well, you need an enemy, and that's exactly what's going on today over there in the Ukraine. That's why we're indirectly funding Russia and China, building them up in preparation for war. But in the Muslim world, we are actually funding and helping establish these countries under Sharia law when the Muslims don't want it, but we do. The best enemy money could buy. Go right ahead, Dennis. Uh, yeah, and so that could be an example of misdirection. Uh, also, uh, Mitt Romney, when he was running for the president uh, against uh, Obama, uh, he it's not like the Obama is their guy and he, they must have him and he must win and so forth. Uh, Mitt Romney uh, would also be a, a puppet of the power elite. For example, uh, when I say a puppet, if he were had been elected president, I'm pretty sure he would not have canceled NAFTA or GATT or you no know, permanent normal trade relations with communist China. Uh, so uh, their preferred candidate in 2012 was uh, President Obama because of his Muslim background and so on. And as I said, leading us towards socialism, you know, the takeover of uh, General Motors and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and so on. And uh, uh, for the power elite, uh, Mitt Romney, uh, I guess you'd call him like their Wendell Wilkie of 2012. Uh, Wilkie was actually chosen by the power elite to lose to President Roosevelt in 1940. So as I've said, not only does the power elite pick winners, they pick they have designated losers as well. I think everybody's forgotten Wendell Wilkie was a Democrat until about two months before he ran for the Republican <laughs> nomination for president. We'll be right back. Go right ahead. Uh, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> so there's designated winners and uh, designated losers. And, uh, uh, for example, uh, Mitt Romney, uh, when he was campaigning against uh, President uh, Obama, uh, there were a lot of things he could have said, just like John McCain could have said a lot of things when he ran for the presidency, but he did. And uh, specifically mentioning Benghazi, as I did, Romney could have made a big issue of that. 
You know, he could have said uh, they didn't provide enough security for the U.S. ambassador and other Americans in Libya, but he didn't. He didn't make a big issue of that. You know, it's like John Kerry when he was running against uh, uh, President George uh, W. Bush the second time, 2004. Uh, he was a fellow Skull and Bones member, so he's a designated loser, and he, he would not, you know, ask certain things or bring up certain things uh, so that, uh, you know, you, you put on a, a face of a, an opponent, but uh, you don't really try really, really hard. And, and, and I think it's so important for people to understand that in 2004, uh, you had two members of the same secret society running for the president. One, of course, George W. Bush. Remember, he was the Republican nominee for the presidency, member of Skull and Bones. And John Kerry, certainly a Democrat presidential nominee, also a member of Skull and Bones. And basically, of course, it was just as phony as a $3 bill. In fact, there was one, one uh, certainly a commentator who actually had the a temerity to get both of these men, uh, John, uh, George W. Bush and John Kerry, onto his uh, television program and ask them, I mean, uh, if they were members of the secret society, Skull and Bones. Both of them dodged the subject, and well, but you don't have to worry. That a TV commentator died uh, at 59 just shortly thereafter. But go right ahead. Is that Tim Brussard? You're right, Tim Russert, right? Yeah. There, there's certain things you never ask. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, here you have a case where Mitt Romney could have brought these things up, but instead President Obama, supported by the press, has uh, made it look like a sort of macho commander-in-chief sending the Marines to the region, demanding the Libyan perpetrators be brought to justice, and so forth. Well, what about that? Uh, I mean, what about the demand? Have they been brought to justice? No, they haven't been brought to justice. Uh, a spokesman for the Libyan government uh, back at that time I told that same a woman, Elizabeth Palmer. Uh, hold that thought. Hold that thought. We'll be back here in just a moment. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and Dr. Cuddy is simply talking about how so much of what we uh, see is just a stage acting. It all appears that we're seeing both sides, uh, but of course it's all certainly political theater. And what was this one uh, issue you were just beginning to bring up? Well, uh, it was a case of uh, where President Obama uh, says, I demand that the perpetrators of the uh, killing assassination of Ambassador Stevens and the others be brought to justice. Well, this, uh, is, this has been Gaza, the right, Gaza exactly. crisis, right, of course. Because, uh, oh, my goodness, you know, we're so concerned about them, but, of course, they actually they could have sent in support and protected them. They didn't. Uh, there were actually two generals who wanted to send in support, who were relieved of command, because they wanted to save the American ambassador. But go right ahead. Uh, uh, right. So you, you think on the one hand, wow, look, he's a macho guy, he's demanding, but then uh, there's no follow-up. Now, the American public, if you keep them busy enough, like Orwell said, you know, quicken the tempo of human life and so forth and so on, that uh, they have a rather short attention span. And so uh, the, the pressure hasn't been brought up, and so those uh, individuals, the perpetrators in Libya, they haven't been, uh, they haven't been brought to justice. And in fact... Uh, uh, at the period I was talking about shortly after the incident, on September 20th, uh, the CBS Evening News uh, said I uh, was interviewing a spokesman for the new uh, Libyan government about uh, all of this, you know, the perpetrators. And uh, he frankly told her, he says, my government uh, is not yet strong enough to confront the, these alleged perpetrators. And so uh, President Obama, uh, he would, you know, I mean, wh what... What's happening? Where's where's the justice? Uh, on the one hand, uh, Gaddafi was the dictator, okay? So the, the new government, when they were uh, sending the power, uh, they were slaughtering people right and left. Uh, I remember telling your listeners, there's a whole village of uh, black uh, Africans in Libya. I mean, the, most of the people being Arab uh, and Muslim, but there are villages there. It uh, was just burned alive, practically. Uh, just because they they were thought to have been uh, siding with uh, Gaddafi, they weren't. But the the uh, rebels, as it were, uh, thought that they were. So they just wiped them out. And uh, have you heard of them being brought to justice? Uh, no, no, no. However, if Milosevic did something up in Yugoslavia, well, we'll get him, and so we'll have to bring him before the Hague, and, and so forth and so on. And so uh, what uh, what happens is these. The, the changing of the American public to be dumbed down in terms of education, not as knowledgeable, 
to have uh, so many things thrown at them that the, uh, the tempo of human life is quickened so that they cannot calmly reflect and organize in opposition to something or you know, participate in a process of uh, restoring the constitutional order in this country. And so uh, that's, those are examples of uh, misdirection. Now, on the one hand, uh, the president like Obama would say, I demand you know, the, uh, the perpetrators be brought, brought to justice. Uh, but he knows that the public isn't going to have any great outcry, and they're going to soon you know, forget about that, be on to some other crisis in the news uh, or some you know, newsworthy event like global climate change. It used to be global warming. They don't say that much anymore. It's just global climate change, the climate, whatever it is. So they had to uh, have a variation on that. Uh, now, that's uh, my chapter on misdirection, and uh, the remainder of that chapter uh, actually covers how the uh, the paralytic uses misdirection in the form of uh, reactions to crises uh, to initiate wars, uh, and because wars are very important, uh, very important part of the, the ultimate plan and population control. Uh, so, one of the uh, favorite tactics. Uh, of the paralyte and accomplishing its uh, ultimate goal uh, of world control, you would look first, I would think, a useful starting point anyway, would be uh, about a 100 years ago in the Spanish-American War. Uh, and the impetus for that war was the misdirection of blame on Spain for the explosion of the battleship Maine. That, that occurred on uh, February 15th of 1898. And later, of course, it was discovered that the explosion was not from a planted uh, uh, external charges, but rather uh, inside uh, the U.S. battleship itself. But uh, that doesn't matter. It was convenient to, to create this legend that it was uh, that it was on the outside, which would imply you know terrorists coming at the ship had done this. And so it doesn't matter. The same thing with the Tonkin Gulf resolutions that got us into uh, the Vietnam War. Later on, you find out it never happened. But hey, you know the the goal the goal was accomplished. War was begun and. Up to a million uh, soldiers uh, eventually went over there, and 55 or so thousand uh, lost their lives. Uh, so uh, they, they rely on several things about the American public, their fascination with fun and games and uh, their lack of real knowledge, uh, having them dumbed down, uh, to be able to accomplish that, including also the affective domain, the decisions made on the basis of some sort of emotional reaction rather than thoughtful consideration of the four or five reasons you might want to buy a particular product. Uh, that was the, the main. It was the, you know, the late uh, 18th, uh, late 19th century. And then there was the First World War. Uh, its origin uh, was due to the Austrian ultimatum and reaction uh, to Serbia over the, uh, the assassination, uh, which would be the crisis, of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And that occurred uh, late June of 1914. And the misdirection occurred with the British Secretary of State, Sir Edward Grey. I mentioned him before, uh, making statements to a uh, German ambassador to England, uh, Prince uh, Karl uh, Lichnowsky, that didn't, did not make it clear that Britain would enter the conflict if Germany did. So here's how they used misdirection in terms of war. Uh, the Germans would uh, say, well, I'm going to come in on the side of Austria-Hungary because Russia is going to uh, oppose them, and Russia's big, and I want to help the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But Germany would say to itself, I don't want to do it if England and France are coming in. So he asked them, and they say, no, no, we're not coming in. So Germany does enter the uh, war effort on behalf of Austria-Hungary. And then, lo and behold, uh, Sir Edward Grey lied. Basically, you know, it seems like a favorite pastime. I mentioned last week about, I think, about Arnold Toynbee, just, just flat-out lying. And so it's that, that sort of Machiavellian, uh, the ends justifies the means thing. And it was basically the whole idea was to convince the Germans, oh, it's all right for you to come into the war on the side of the Austro-Hungarians because we're not going to come in the war. And then, of course, when uh, the Germany enters the war on the side of Austria-Hungary, why they say we lied, now we're going to go to war with you. And then the Germans do everything they can to establish peace, and there's no way we will allow peace because they want the war and peace. 
people don't understand that behind the British government is a secret society. At that time, they called it the Association of Helpers or the Round Table. Doesn't matter what you call it. And basically, of course, they wanted the war. And then, of course, they hoped this would bring about the League of Nations because it had nothing to do with making money. It had to do with bringing about a one-world government. And then, of course, when World War One failed, then we had to have World War Two. And when World War Two failed to bring about the one-world government of the United Nations, that's why World War Three is coming. It's not a matter of if, but when. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, and so the, all of these I'm giving are examples of reactions to crises to initiate conflict. And there's all types of misdirection. I've been through some of them, but these, these specific, uh, specific examples are how they use reactions to crises to uh, initiate wars. So you had the initiation of the war, Spanish-American War, the sinking of the bank. Uh, then you have the initiation of the uh, the First World War. That would be another example of misdirection, where Sir Edward Grey uh, led the German ambassador, Lichnowski, to believe that uh, England, at least, as well as France, but mainly England, would not enter uh, the war. And then, of course, they did. And the Second World War was the, the same sort of thing, uh, with America declaring war, that's the reaction, uh, to the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor, and that's the crisis. They were having reactions to crises to, in order to initiate wars. And the uh, the Japanese attack upon Pearl Harbor was their reaction uh, to the crisis uh, of an American blockade and other actions against them. So, you know, these, you sucker Japan into this, you develop the strategy to get them into the war, uh, so that you could then be uh, in a war with Germany, which the American public would have objected to if they just, you know, tried that directly. You know, let's let's get into the war against Germany, okay, because the, the the people at that time in the country were very very uh, skeptical and war weary, and uh, and so on. And so that would be the example of uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, that was their reaction, the Japanese reaction to the crisis of an American blockade and uh, and other actions. Uh, the misdirection uh, was actually against the American people uh, in the sense that the attack upon Pearl Harbor was presented as a surprise uh, when President Roosevelt's uh, actions in, intentionally uh, provoked the Japanese attack, and uh, FDR, of course, knew it was coming. And okay. anybody who doubts that, actually, when I went through Colonel House's papers uh, back at, uh, at Yale, University, why we actually found documentation of the fact. I've been not actually. I, I went through the papers of uh, at the American ambassador to Germany at the time, and I, his basically had actually written uh, in his diary, William Todd, and he written in his diary that on the 25th of November, this was what uh, uh, almost two weeks before the attack, he had gone to the White House and President Roosevelt had said, "Look, we're probably going to have a, an attack this coming Monday." Uh, I mean, basically, oh, the only question is, how are we going to get into the war and get the uh, Japanese to fire the first shot? If anybody wants to see the pages from Ambassador Dodd's diary, we actually have them. I went back to Yale, I copied them, and they knew the attack was coming, and they left our boys there. It's that the, ambassador, pardon me, the uh, American Admiral Kimmel wanted to send the, the battleships to sea. They wouldn't let him ship, send the ships to sea, because if he had the Japanese, wouldn't have attacked. We'd already taken the aircraft carriers out, and basically if the sh battleships hadn't been there, the Japanese never would have attacked. But they wanted the attack, and as it said in Ambassador Dodge diary, and we'll be glad to give anybody a copy of it, the only question is, how are we going to get into the war and get the Japanese to fire the first shot? So we left our 3,000 American boys to be slaughtered, didn't tell them the attack was coming. They knew in Washington, D.C., all the reports knew exactly where the Japanese Japanese fleet war, except the commanders at Pearl Harbor. They left our boys there to die, just like they left the people in the Twin Towers to die on the, in 2001. Go right ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I think uh, Ambassador Dodd did the uh, the other letter about the corporations, so I believe uh, Secretary of War Henry Stimson. Is You're absolutely about. right. Thank you for correcting me. That was Secretary of War Stimson. Yep. Uh, well, another example of this direction uh, following World War II would be uh, when we uh, said uh, to the nationalist Chinese, and Chiang Kai-shek, yes, we are faithful to you. Yes, we will support you a thousand percent. So on. You know, watch out when we say we're going to stick with you for a long time if you're another nation because we uh, we don't really tell the truth. 
Uh, so uh, the American people, in that case, were misdirected into thinking that our government actually supported the nationalist Chinese, uh, when actually uh, General George Marshall took measures to, to disarm them, uh, thereby you know, allowing the communist Chinese to succeed in their revolution of uh, 1949. And the parallel, of course, would likewise support the, uh, the communist revolution of uh, Fidel Castro in Cuba in 1959. And there, there too, uh, Dr. Stan interviewed our ambassador, who, uh, you know, frankly admitted that uh, Castro had been a communist all along. Uh, right? That's right. That's yeah. Ambassador Earl T. Earl Smith. And basically, oh, well, basically, they told us that we had no idea he was a communist. And, and as he told me, and you can actually see, we have the interview uh, with him uh, available on DVD. Why he, he told me that everybody knew Fidel Castro was a communist. The president knew. He knew. Certainly the people in the State Department knew Fidel Castro was a communist. But they didn't tell the American people. And we actively helped him to come to power. And then of course, we know that suddenly David Rockefeller's daughters go down to visit Fidel Castro, and, and Fidel comes up to visit David Rockefeller, and that's covered in, in David Rockefeller's book, Memoirs. But the American people honestly think that Cuba is the enemy, ladies and gentlemen. It's a wonderful enemy, so we can rally the people behind our government to protect us against from that wicked Fidel Castro that we brought to power. Go ahead. Uh yeah, and uh, <clears throat> so uh, what happened was if you allow the communist Chinese to have their revolution uh, succeed in gaining power in 1949, and Castro was in 59, uh, what you did with the, the communist Chinese uh, revolution in 1949 is you allowed them to be in a position, of course, to help the North Koreans. In that conflict, uh, the Korean War in the early uh, 1950s, uh, we supported uh, the South Koreans there. And what that did was put us into a situation where we'd have this no-win war. This is the first, I guess you'd say, of our, our no-win wars. And uh, that I have mentioned back uh, when I was talking about the, the parallels and their history is what Philip Freneau had said in the, uh, I believe, the July 1792 issue of American Museum. as the title of that publication as to how he called it the hereditary elite would regain control uh, of America, you'd get uh, get them involved in these uh, these no win wars, and so that's that's another part of this strategy that the power elite uses, and uh, the same uh, no win war strategy, of course, uh, was also followed in the 1960s, early 70s uh, in uh, Vietnam, and uh, that was uh, begun over the American reaction to the crisis of the North Vietnamese uh, PT boats attacking. A U.S. destroyer, uh, and that was on August 2nd, um, August 2, uh, 1964, in the Gulf of Tonkin. Of course, later it was discovered that the attack never occurred, as uh, as once again the American public uh, had been misdirected. So uh, all along, you, you've got these cases of the Spanish-American War, the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War, uh, the Vietnam War. All of these things uh, have a certain amount of misdirection to them. And uh, each one of them, you can identify the reaction to a crisis as the uh, the vehicle they would uh, they would use. And then uh, after that, in uh, 1991, of course, you have the Gulf War, uh, and which uh, the U.S. attacked Iraq. You know uh, that that situation with George H. Uh, uh, w. Bush, and uh, more recently in the 21st, early 21st century with George W. Bush. Uh, and so how, how does that uh, how does that work? Well, it was the same thing as Sir Edward Gray back in the First World War, where he would basically lie to Prince Lysnowski, the Germans, uh, about whether they would uh, get themselves involved. And so, you know, if, if the public is sufficiently dumb and ignorant of history, then you can just try that again. That's what, uh, that's what we did. And, of course, George W. Bush basically said, oh, well, Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. He has weapons of mass destruction. Well, he did have weapons of mass destruction. He had poison gas, which were given to him. Uh, actually, we'd given to him back in the 1980s. He never mentioned that, but, oh, Saddam has weapons of mass destruction. Poison gas, that's why we've got to go to war, but you know, of course, Saddam actually got rid of it. He transferred it all over into, into Syria. And that's the poison gas that certainly that Assad has. But nobody ever tells the American people that. Go right ahead, Dennis. Uh, yeah, and so uh, since it worked in the First World War, in this direction of just lying to the Germans, uh, I guess uh, you could say we did the same sort of thing with the, the 1991 Gulf War. Uh, 
where the Kuwaitis had been slant drilling, sucking out oil from uh, the Iraqi side of the border. And so, you know, Saddam Hussein goes and asks our ambassador to Iraq, April Glassby, uh, what about this? Uh, and uh, uh, Saddam Hussein was told, well, it's your you know internal affairs, it's your business, no big deal. So he, he believed that if he did invade Kuwait, because they were basically stealing from him, uh, he would not be met with any American military response. And, of course, we know what happened. Hold that thought. We'll be right back. Well, this is Dr. Stan. Uh, go right ahead, Dennis. We've got three minutes here to wrap up the program. Okay. Well, we're getting towards the end of this chapter of misdirection. But you can see each of these cases, the Spanish-American War, First World War, Second World War, uh, Korean War, Vietnam, and you come up to the First Gulf War, uh, all, of, all of these can be shown to pretty well have a uh, misdirection uh, strategy of reaction to crises. There's a crisis, there's a, a, mis, there's a reaction to the crisis, and it's based initially at least on, on misdirecting your, your enemy or, you know, whoever you want to set up. And uh, same thing with American uh, NATO involvement in the, Bos- uh, the Bosnian War. In the late 1990s uh, followed the, the pattern, in this case, not of World War One, like the Syria with great lying to Prince Zostowski, but this followed the pattern of World War Two. Uh, in, the, in the sense that the United States reacted to the humanitarian crisis that uh, occurred in Kosovo. Now, that uh, so-called crisis occurred uh, because Yugoslav leader Slobodan Milosevic was reacting to his own crisis, uh, the Kosovo Liberation Army uh, terrorists inciting uh, murder and chaos there. And uh, it, there was actually a title by the Canadian ambassador to Yugoslavia, he, uh, in the Toronto Globe and Mail, this is back in 2001, and he titled his article, We we Have Created a Monster. We Have Created a Monster. And uh, the uh, CIA and others that had armed and trained the KLA in Albania uh, to foment a revolution in Kosovo, uh, which then resulted in the assassination of uh, Serbian mayors and the ambush of Serbian police. And so what happened? Most of it reacted to that crisis. And then we said, oh, look at that. There's a humanitarian crisis, so we'll have to intervene. And that's, uh, that's basically how they used misdirection and reactions to crises to move uh, us further along towards their ultimate plan of a world federal government. And it's the same pattern, deja vu, all over again. Uh, yeah. The, the, in fact, the Iraq War of 2003 followed the pattern, that same pattern of World War II. Uh, the public was misdirected against Iraq after the U.S. attacked the Taliban in Afghanistan. Remember, we got to go into Afghanistan. All of a sudden, there was a switch. So, well, what switch? Why? Why? Why did we switch? I thought, you know, Osama was over in uh, Afghanistan. But all of a sudden, we said, no, no, we're switching. Now we're going to have a big effort against Saddam Hussein. Well, uh, it's, it's the same pattern over and over again. Yep. Dennis, we're out of time. God bless you. We'll look forward to talking to you here soon, or real soon next week at the same time. Hey, thanks for having me. God bless, and we'll you be too. back in just a moment uh, here at Radio Liberty. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and we do hope you enjoy our weekly interviews with Dr. Dennis Cuddy, certainly one of my favorite people, one of my favorite historians, well, I think the finest historian we have in America today. And basically, of course, he's been blacklisted. Why? Because he tells the truth, and you're not allowed to tell the truth. Well, basically, uh, so the, the, the books that he has that are still in print, and he's written probably 15 books or more, but we do carry his book, The Power Elite, and The Secret Nazi Plan, The the Power Elite, Its History and Its Future, though these are two separate books. Uh, Certainly his book on The Secret Betrayal uh, is not available, but we have uh, certain modifications of that. We have modifications of several of his things. We have his book uh, uh, on uh, famous quotes. There's about 3,000 famous quotes. Give us a call at 1-800-544-8927. 1-800-544-8927. Ask for a list of Dr. Cuddy's books. We carry all that are available today. Get them or read them through. Memorize what he has to say. Understand that we're involved in a spiritual battle for the souls of men and the survival of Christian civilization. And then, of course, if you haven't read my book, Brotherhood of Darkness, shame on you. You need to get the book. You need to have the information. You need to have a 
help us get this out because behind everything that's going on today are all sorts of secret societies, not one, but a number of different secret societies. Of course, the most prominent ones in the United States are the Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission. Now you say, well, they're not secret societies. You can go to their web pages and you're absolutely right. But they're fronts for secret societies. And if you want to know the background of the secret society that created the Council on Foreign Relations, you need to read Professor Quigley's wonderful book, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, which, of course, we actually know a lot about that. We've been back to Georgetown University on several occasions to go through Professor Quigley's papers there, and we talk to his mistress, and we talk to his wife, and we talk to his best friends. We talk to his students, and we talk to the people who took care of his papers, and we were able to photograph a lot of them before they could be systematically destroyed, which is what they ordinarily do to conceal the truth. But his book, two books, first of all, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, and then a book he wrote in 1949 and could never get published. The most prominent historian in America couldn't get the book published during his lifetime. It was published about 1981. The Anglo-American Establishment, going into the secret society of the first the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Council on Foreign Relations birthed the Trilateral Commission. And go to the Trilateral Commission website, ladies and gentlemen, trilateral.org, and look at their logo. Trilateral.org, look at their logo, if you understand what it is. It's three sixes bound together by an upside-down broken cross. Three sixes bound together by an upside-down broken cross were involved in a spiritual battle for the souls of men and the survival of Christian civilization, and you're never going to hear about this. And the average church today, because they've infiltrated our seminaries, and they've told ministers not to talk about this sort of thing. And we've had a number of ministers listening to our programs who've had the courage to come forward and talk about it, and they've taken action against them, and many of them have lost their ministries. So they, Pastor Billy Crow, if you haven't got his DVDs on the final countdown, we have uh, certainly eight sets. Each one has five or six DVDs in it. Final countdown, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They even went after Pastor Billy Crone. Fortunately, he had enough people in his congregation that he was able to maintain his ministry. But any minister who has the courage to speak out and tell the truth today will come under Sydney under pressure, just as there's been pressure to shut down our ministry and other ministries that tell you the truth. Our number is one eight hundred five four four eight nine two seven. Quite frankly, we need your financial help to maintain our network of stations. But we do have a network of stations, and people are learning the truth. Again, our number one eight hundred five four four eight nine two seven. Our web page is RadioLiberty.com. Please pray for America, but pray for revival, but pray for Radio Liberty, our provision and our protection. Oh, 